Good afternoon. I'm Mitchell Reese, the president of Washington College, and I want to welcome our distinguished panelists, our guests in the audience, and all those watching around the country to the Decker Theater at Washington College. Today's event is co-sponsored by the Harwood Endowment, which was established by Richard L. Harwood, one of the country's leading journalists, and by the Louis Goldstein Program in Public Affairs. I'll be standing in for John Harwood, who was supposed to moderate today's panel. But John has been told by MSNBC to cover the president's nationally televised speech later this evening, and he sends his regrets. We are grateful that his mother, B is here tonight, and I would like to thank her for remaining a loyal Washington College friend and supporter. We are also proud to claim B's granddaughter, Kelly Minchik, a member of the class of 2007, as part of the Harwood family legacy at Washington College. Ten years ago this week, the United States homeland was attacked. It's likely that every person here, every American, can today remember vividly where he or she was on that fateful day. We saw an outpouring of sympathy and support from around the world as we all struggled to make sense of the attacks to learn more about our enemies, and to arm ourselves psychologically as well as militarily for what was soon termed the War on Terror. This afternoon, we have brought to our campus four of the country's leading experts on counterterrorism to help us assess the victories and losses of this war 10 years after the attacks, help us understand how we've changed during this past decade, and explore the forms and shapes terrorism might assume in the coming 10 years. Their full biographies are in your programs, but let, me, but let me briefly introduce them. Admiral Dennis Blair served our country with distinction for 34 years in the Navy, rising to become Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Pacific Command with responsibilities that extended over 50% of the world's surface. He later served as the Director of National Intelligence during the Obama administration. Among his many honors, he has been awarded four Defense Distinguished Service Medals and three National Intelligence Distinguished Service Medals. Dr. Audrey Cronin has had an impressive career in both academia and government, including positions at Oxford University, Columbia, Georgetown, the National War College, the U.S. Navy, the Department of Defense, and the School of Public Policy at George Mason University, where she currently teaches. She has written one of the very finest books on terrorism in Al-Qaeda, entitled How Terrorism Ends, Understanding the Decline and Demise of Terrorist Groups, which will be available for purchase after our session in the Underwood Lobby. <laughs> Perhaps most important of all, Audrey is a Washington College parent. Ambassador Kofor Black is on his way here as we speak, having been caught in some of the flooding around the Washington, D.C. area. But let me introduce him anyway. He has had a career in counterterrorism that seems like it was ripped from a Hollywood movie script. He spent three decades in the clandestine service of the CIA, where he helped track down and capture Carlos the Jackal, among many other operations. On 9-11, he famously refused to evacuate CIA headquarters, saying that this was where he belonged, whether or not another airliner was headed for Langley. He has led the CIA's Counterterrorism Center and was in charge of the State Department's global counterterrorism efforts. Many people consider him to be the world's foremost authority on counterterrorism. Dr. Sarah Sewell is currently a professor of international affairs at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government. She has forged a remarkable career that bridges the worlds of academia, ethics, and national security. Among her many posts, she has served as the director of the Carr Center for Human Rights, where she helped General David Petraeus develop a new counterinsurgency strategy for the U.S. Army and Marines. She has also had previous government experience in both the Defense Department and on Capitol Hill. Welcome to each of you. Over the past several weeks, we've received questions from our alumni around the country and from members of this audience this afternoon, which I have in my hand here. Let me start by asking a question to each of the panelists that many have raised. 
Are we safer now than we were on 9-11? Are we winning or losing this war? And how do we know? Perhaps we can start with Audrey first. Well, I'm going to address the second part, the question, are we winning or losing? Because the question of whether we're safer or not is actually um, a little bit different. But the question of whether we're winning or losing, I think the answer is that we are winning, but it isn't necessarily only because of what we are doing. It's also because Al-Qaeda is losing. So um, an answer to that question really has to be placed in a, in a number of different levels. The first one is operationally. Operationally, definitely, there's been gratifying progress. There has been tremendous cooperation among states that didn't exist before now. The, the um, elimination of considerable part of the Al-Qaeda leadership, the fact that we have um, much better intelligence cooperation, the fact that we are just a lot better at doing, um, at understanding Al-Qaeda and knowing how to track members of Al-Qaeda, all of that is very well covered in the press and gets a tremendous amount of attention. And I would say that those are operational uh, advancements. But strategically, the picture is much more uh, murky and a little bit more unclear. Strategically, I think this group is either going to implode, and we see many different um, elements of implosion with, with the group uh, engaging in a tremendous amount of infighting, with um, a deep loss of popular support within Muslim majority countries, which has become quite apparent, and with the fact that Al Qaeda itself, as a brand, and even individuals in Al Qaeda like bin Laden, no longer have the kind of appeal that they once had. So the group, in terms of its popular support, has been greatly diminished, especially since I would say about 2007 or 2008. But with respect to whether it can transition, that is, whether it can transition into a movement that takes, uh, that takes a future in its hands in a place like Yemen or some other part of the Arab world, is murkier. Because even though the Arab Spring gives us a tremendous amount of encouragement, and I think is one of the key variables in undermining Al Qaeda, um, the fact that Al Qaeda was not the moving force in the Arab Spring, it was not the agent of change that it insisted it would be. Nonetheless, we don't yet know how that's going to come out. So that's the murkier part of whether we're winning or losing. I think we need to wait a little while and find out exactly what happens in places like Egypt and Yemen. Uh, and Tunisia, and even perhaps Libya. I'm very hopeful and I'm very optimistic, and I think actually that Al Qaeda is sidelined as a result of the Arab Spring. But it would be very foolish to um, draw a direct trajectory when things are so unsettled. Admiral. Yeah, I think part of the question has to do with the, uh, the context and understanding of, of what it is we're up against. Um, I remember. Uh, I was out in Hawaii as a commander in chief of the Pacific Command when 9-11 happened. It was three in the morning uh, at, at that time. And of course, once it, once it happened, we all began diving into everything we knew about that uh, organization and parts around the world. And it turns out that we'd been, uh, and I was in charge of a lot of our military forces, uh, incredibly ignorant about uh, this group, which in fact had a, a uh, an Asian branch called Shema Islamaya, which cooperated with it and which attempted to carry out a, a few attacks in, in future years. One that was successful was uh, the one in Bali, which killed about 200, 200 people in, in Indonesia. So uh, we, didn't, we knew very little bit about this group and the, and the threat that it was. And I think that was part of the horror of it, this attack coming out of nowhere, as far as most people knew, being so inventive and so so terrible. So I think what's one thing that's made us safer is that in the 10 years since, we've really whittled down our understanding of what it really is we're up against. And it's not a war on terror. It's a campaign against a group called Al Qaeda, which has a core group, has some franchises, and then has some inspirational value. So I think a very important thing in making us safer is our is this level of uh, level of understanding. Um, if you, look at the, if you look at the facts, I guess what we're really worried about here, aren't we, are, are terrible, sudden, uh, gory deaths. That's what, that's what this terrorist group poses. There have been, in the United States in the last 10 years that we've been talking about, 17 of those attributable to Al Qaeda. Let's put this, in, put this in context. Let's just talk about automobile deaths. Pretty violent, pretty gory. Half a million during that time. 
Add in murders and rapes, another over half a million. So violent deaths to Americans, a million, due to causes which don't seem to turn us into such a, cause such a reaction. 17 from this group that we're, we're talking about. I, I think we're beginning to put this into context because that kind of discussion is, is beginning, to, uh, beginning to take place. So I think that, in addition, um, can, can make us make more sensible decisions about this as we, as we go forward. And I agree with everything that, uh, that Audrey said, that uh, our understanding of it and our ability to keep it in check op at an operational level is much, much better than it was. Sarah. Well, I guess to add something slightly different in terms of an answer to the question that hasn't already been covered, because I do agree with both of the views expressed by uh, Dr. Cronin and Admiral Blair, but I guess I would, I would raise some questions about um, where we, the United States, are 10 years after the 9-11 the attacks. And, to me, I mean, it's quite remarkable the extent to which we've been able to eliminate the safe havens that we became concerned about initially, and we've been able to decapitate key leaders within the Al-Qaeda network. But at the same time, we have to think about the costs that we have assumed as a society. And those come in a lot of different forms. They come in the form of the sheer economics of it and the difficulty of weighing dollar for dollar what it means to force people to put small amounts of liquid into a bag when they check onto a plane or try to screen all the cargo that comes into this country and how we will just be trying to close another barn door after the horse has left and we'll sort of chase that, that infinitesimal search for perfect security at, at enormous economic cost. And it's very difficult to know where the marginal value is in that race. And we've spent a lot, a lot, a lot of money um, on things that may have been redundant and may have been unnecessary. And we're really not sure if we've done exactly all the right things that perhaps will prove in retrospect to have been important. So there, I think it's difficult to know. One thing that is clear is that the war in Afghanistan has cost us a lot of money. The war in Iraq, while not directly a response to terrorism, has cost us a lot of money. And our, our quest for security and our prosecution of those two wars have collectively been significantly responsible for the financial circumstances in which we find ourselves, obviously not exclusively, but we're talking about trillions of dollars. And when one asks where we would be as a country in terms of our strength and our security, I think there are valid questions to be posed as to whether chasing the increment on airline security versus securing infrastructure or strengthen the economy or you know, a bunch of other things that have to do with other aspects of national security, such as economic strength that ultimately drives your ability to have a strong military and be militarily powerful. I think there, again, the record is mixed. And then I think finally I would say that we have, we have incurred some collateral damage in our quest for security uh, from a very real threat because of the choices that we've made and how we go about it. Um, again, you can debate whether or not the Iraq war falls into a response mode, but that did an enormous amount of damage to our perceived legitimacy as a member of a rule-bound international community. Um, and we haven't dug out from that. And we also had some um, choices that were made from very genuine beliefs about the nature of the threat in terms of the tactics that we would use to prosecute the fight against the enemy that have also undermined the perception of the United States as a country that follows the rule of law and upholds human rights. And so I think those are also costs that have, to some degree, security ramifications that affect the way we have to ultimately evaluate our security in a post-9-11 environment. So I don't think we can just look at Al-Qaeda, I don't think we can just look at terrorism, I think we have to look at how that, how our response to those very real threats also redounds and affects us and the opportunity costs that that response has engendered. I think that's the fuller accounting of, of where we are now. Thank you, Sarah. The next question follows on from that, actually. Uh, a number of people sent in questions that raise concerns over whether personal freedoms at home 
and human rights abroad have been sacrificed in the war on terror. Now, this is a complex area that touches on other questions about whether the U.S. should use enhanced interrogation techniques, including waterboarding, which many believe to be torture, whether we should keep Guantanamo open, and whether some prisoners there will ever be prosecuted. Could you please address the balancing act between adherence to constitutional principles and the need to defend ourselves from dedicated and ruthless enemies? Well, I was in the middle of that, so, and so let me, let me start out. Uh, when I came in with the uh, Obama administration, one of the first, um, first things we did was to, uh, one of the first things the president did was to sign executive orders, which announced that Guantanamo would be closed, which uh, abolished the so-called enhanced interrogation te techniques, one of which was uh, uh, waterboarding. And then there was a decision a little bit later to uh, release the um, Inspector General's report, uh, which investigated the CIA's use of enhancing interrogation techniques. So all of the dis discussions uh, swirled around that, uh, swirled around those questions that uh, people are interested in. Let me ju let me just make a a, a couple of points. Um, it's hard to recapture the, the feelings that everybody had on September 11th, 2001, when this, uh, when this event happened. And as I mentioned, the degree of ignorance of just what we were facing was, uh, was so, so great. And the drive to get information on just how big the threat was and what we could do about it was, uh, was enormous. And so when some uh, Al-Qaeda uh, terrorists were were captured. Uh, there was a great deal of of, uh, of pressure to find out what they could tell us. Turns out that the there's there's no science in interrogation. It's all an anecdotal. You, you see it on television: the good cop, the bad cop, the, the uh, person who can question somebody skillfully, the person who beats them up. Uh, uh, it turned out we, that we had done no research as a world, as a country, on, on what works and, and what doesn't. So I, I have a hard time, I have a hard time um, really criticizing the decision made at that time, and it was made at the very highest levels. The CIA brought it all up to the White House. It was all discussed, uh, legal, legally checked, and they uh, used these in techniques on a limited number of people for a limited number of, for a limited amount of time. Uh, back in 2002, 2003. After that, we had enough knowledge that we could use the most effective form of interrogation, which is to take the information you have and, and, uh, and use it to get more information from ad additional people. So, and that's what, we, what we've used since, and we've been very successful about it. And I was very much in favor of uh, banning those interrogation techniques, uh, using only those which are specified in the Department of Defense interrogation manual, which are, which are, which are based on military uh, uh, traditions, not on, uh, not on uh, intelligence uh, uh, traditions. So, so I, I think we're, we're in the right place right now. Uh, on, on Guantanamo, uh, yeah, it should, be, it should be closed. It's a terrible symbol of, uh, of, of everything that, um, you know, puts the United States on an equal footing with, uh, with others around the world, as uh, Dr. Sewell said. Uh, it turned out it was politically uh, impossible to, to do. Uh, it, uh, con Congress uh, reflecting what they saw as the popular will uh, prevent it from happening. No one was going to have, uh, have these uh, couple hundred or so really bad characters uh, in there in their state, in their, in their, in, in their district. So we're pretty much uh, stymied, on, uh, stymied on, that, on that one. Um, the 200 or so people who are, who are in there have been, have been reviewed, by, uh, reviewed very carefully by a huge team of which I was, I was a part, and we argued over every single, every single case as to whether that person should be let out, uh, given some sort of uh, judicial process, or, or kept in. Uh, about 100 were, were released and turned to their countries. About 25% of those who were released have gone back to the battlefield and are, are trying to 
uh, kill Americans and others uh, right right now. Uh, so didn't get that one all all right. Uh, another hundred or so were um, were um, uh, we decided to give have trials of some kind, either a federal trial or a or a military court martial trial. And then there were a hundred uh, which we judged did not have. There was not enough information to have any kind of a any kind of a trial, and yet uh, what, what we had on them, based on all sources, interrogating them, interrogating others about them, circumstances of their capture, subsequent intelligence information, we thought were just too dangerous to uh, turn loose again. We were pretty convinced that they would turn back and start trying to uh, come back to the battlefield uh, against us then. So you know, these, were, these were conscientious people trying to make the best uh, best decisions they could, and that's the way it came out, and I think that probably got it about right. Audrey. Um, uh, I'm not going to contradict anything, and, and I agree with what you've said um, as far as the, the fact that I'm very much against torture. I mean, I've always been against um, any kind of waterboarding. I mean, you know, these things are, are quite undermining of American servicemen when they're actually in a similar situation in other um, contexts. But what I wanted to say is that it's very easy for us um, as a kind of a broader public to be, for one thing, demanding perfect security. And for another thing, um, driving our own fear uh, to affect those people that represent us in Congress. I, I'm not trying to excuse any of what happened after 9-11, and, and I'm on the record for having criticized the, some of the excesses that this question talks about. So none of what I'm about to say is trying to excuse any of the um, abrogation of the rule of law and any of the ways in which our country has not lived up to its finest standards. But I would like to say that until we become more resilient as a society, until we become more clear about what it is that we're aiming toward to be the end of this kind of campaign, which I think is a kind of normality, our normality in which terrorism still continues to exist because terrorism isn't going to go away, and in which we, we bear some level of risk. And we have to accept that we're going to have a level of risk until we, as a broader population, understand that we're a great power and we have to realize that that risk will affect us. We're going to be driving people who make decisions in the wrong direction. So um, I, I think that where we need to be now, 10 years after 9-11, is looking forward to the fact that we are likely to be hit again by terrorists, you know, who, whether it be Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda in the Arab Peninsula or you name the group. I mean, it might be a right-wing group, as in Norway. And until we begin to have a more mature attitude toward terrorism as it affects a great power as we are, a predominant power, uh, we're not going to be able to find the kind of normality that we really seek. Um, just briefly, I think I'd like to add a little bit again, thinking about um, the domestic political response. I mean, historically, what the, you know, the United States is sort of famously slow to anger, but once roused, watch out. And um, in some ways, that's the lesson of, of World War II. But we knew what to do in World War II. We'd watch the threat coming. It fit our current paradigms. We were prepared um, to respond to it with things that were familiar, you know, tanks and ships and guns and soldiers. Um, but at the same time, our response also had some excesses domestically, if you think about internment. And if you think about moments when we've been frightened as a country, um, the McCarthy era, again, we tend to, um, for some period of time, abridge our deepest values because we are prioritizing security in the short term. And in many ways, and I think is this it's fair to say President Bush um, is on the record in regard to this. I mean, that's what our leaders believe is their first job. Um, and as Audrey said, that's what we in many ways tell them. I think the 9-11 story, as I understand it, there's a very important nugget embedded in the nation's response to 9-11. And it's not that the response was not understandable because we were frightened and we didn't, as Admiral Blair said, understand the threat. And so we were groping for new ways and we were trying to craft new rules and workarounds and labels, use different kinds of tools, fight a war a different way than we had in the past, et cetera. But we also lacked at that moment certain checks and balances that historically have saved us from excess. There was an enormous amount of secrecy that 
that veiled decision making in those days. And there was a patriotism that wrapped us up so tightly that we almost forgot to breathe and forgot to become questioning citizens. And we had, we had the media playing a role in which it was in many ways um, prevented from asking very important questions that in retrospect on many areas such as secret prisons and, uh, and the Iraq war, regrets not having asked. We had a Congress that um, didn't want to be perceived as undermining uh, executive authority in any way, shape, and form because after all this was a war. And so what happened was that by the grace of being spared many further deaths over the years that followed 9-11, Gradually, we remembered to breathe. Gradually, we got more dispersion of power and ability to disagree respectfully. The different branches of government began to take different views. Um, and we began to see the pendulum shift back. But I think for me, the really chastening um, reminder of 9-11 is that when we are scared, we sometimes um, lose the ability to do what, what has historically stood us in good stead as a nation, which is allowed checks and balances and open, open decision making and vigorous but respectful dissent flourish all in the name of loving your country and wanting to stay safe. And so that's, that's what I really take away from, uh, from the trying to find that balance between liberties and security. It's interesting to compare our experience with experience of at least two democracies that have been under much heavier terrorist sieges than we are, the United Kingdom from the Irish Republican Army uh, and Israel with various periods of bombing. Those, those weren't sort of one bomb attacks and then 10 years of, of, uh, of, of no successful attacks. They were you know, multiple attacks, lots of people killed. And, and how, did those, how did those countries try to keep their democratic conditions yet adjust to the, the new realities? And I think in all cases, uh, they had to come up with ways uh, to handle those which had to have a higher degree of secrecy, uh, couldn't have quite all of the safeguards that we have in a trial of a citizen for a normal crime or for something uh, with them. So you know, we, we, we really had one, one experience, and I think you're right, um, uh, so, sort of the more normal way that Americans approach those sorts of things reasserted themselves. Uh, if they had been sustained as they were for the UK for many years, and Israel for many years, there probably would have been some sort of, some sort of special arrangements made uh, that sacrificed And we may see that. Yeah. yeah. Well, can, I, can I push you just a little bit further? Uh, Sarah and Admiral Blair and I were at a conference on security in Colorado in August, and um, there were some very senior former officials who were speaking, and they said that waterboarding had only been used on three uh, Guantanamo um, prisoners, uh, that there had been none uh, none of this had taken place after 2003, and they, they argued that uh, valuable intelligence information was actually extracted from them. Um, again, that, that's sort of a mixed message in terms of civil liberties, security, uh, but perhaps it suggests, if you focus on the timing, that maybe we've already reasserted the checks and balances, Sarah, that, that you were talking about. Yeah, the tragic thing was that we don't know whether we could have gotten that same information without the without the waterboarding. It's an unknowable question. When I looked at the uh, when I looked at the scientific research on the on the subject, nobody knew what would work. And so when they when when the interrogators didn't have didn't have luck for the first uh, few months that they tried it, they turned to these uh, these techniques. Had they been more skilled, had they had they uh, persisted uh, for using the uh, using the, techniques they had, they might have gotten the same information the same way. And I, I agree completely that it would have been a heck of a lot better. Because even, especially for a country that has as high ideals as, it, as we do, when you have a few instances in which you don't meet them, they're well publicized, they're, they're, and you, you, pay a, you pay a much higher price, price for them because you're on a higher pedestal, you have further, further to fall. So it would have been much better had we not, uh, had, had, we not had to use them. And I don't think we'll, we'll ever know if, um, could have been gotten any other way. I think we should also realize that some of the information that came out was misinformation. And a lot of the, and this is all in the open press, and a lot of the scrambling that we did as a result of things that were, uh, came out of these sessions were wrong. That's true, but some was right also. I mean, I read the, 
I read the evidence, I read the investigation. Some useful information did come out of those sessions. Some of it was bogus, uh, the, way it always, the way it always is. Uh, but to me, the tragedy is we don't know if we could have done it without that. I agree. I wish we had. Next question has to do with General Petraeus, who said that we will not be able to win the war on terror simply by killing or capturing all of the terrorists who hate America, suggesting that the United States also needs to have a strategy of reaching out and engaging the Arab and Muslim world. Do we have such a strategy today? And if not, what would you recommend to the administration? Sarah? Sure. Um, no, we don't have a strategy like that. Um, <laughs> We don't. And you know what? We also don't have the resources to carry out a strategy like that. And part of the reason why we don't have a re the resources to carry out a strategy like that is because we have, we have framed this as a war and we have fought two wars and we have no more money and we're in an economic crisis. I mean, to, uh, to Dr. Cronin's point earlier, you know, a big piece of the way the story will be written decades from now is going to hinge on how many of these countries in transition now turn out. And, you know, I can guarantee you that we're not going to like everything about how the, the governments lead in these countries, about the way, the kinds of law that they enforce, about the kinds of allies that they choose, about the foreign policy positions that they take. And yet, if you step back outside of our immediate labeling of, um, of ideology and policy and orientation and ask what's the biggest challenge? It's to show that there can be competent, responsive, growth generating, moderate, Muslim led governments in the world that can be responsible players in international politics that can provide avenues for growth and for jobs and for security and for self respect and all those things that are part of a backlash of globalization that underpins the ability of an extremist message of any form to generate uh, uh, and, and gain traction in, um, in the world. And so our ability to, you know, as we talked about, about the ways in which America's moral authority has been at least temporarily eroded, We've talked about the economic, the lack of, of tools and political will that we have now to, to engage in non-military ways. Um, if you think about um, what it means to sort of bet on moderate alternatives, we're pretty limited in terms of what we can do. And oh yes, we're in a geopolitical environment in which relative power is changing among other states, so we, we may be limited in a, in a macro systemic sense as well in terms of our ability to affect outcomes. But our, our hope ought to be to engage um, moderate Arab governance and support it. And yet we can't do it directly because we will discredit if we do it too directly. And we can't do it without resources. And we can't do it without the political space to let these countries um, take positions that we may not like in the short term because they're going to need to be, after all, responsive to electorates because we preach that we want these states to be democratic and responsive. And so we're going to have to tolerate what it is that publics that are very different than ours actually support. And so as we try to manage that relationship, I think it's going to be a very delicate and trying time. And we're going to have to fight our own domestic political reaction um, in the midst of being um, hopeful about and tolerant of, of these transitions. Okay. There's another important thing that just underlies all of this, and this is getting off oil. It just, we have just, these would be sort of interesting little countries having problems were it not for the half of the oil that we use in this country coming from that, coming from that region. And we are, we are over 50% of our, of our oil comes, is imported. Uh, the great bulk of that comes from the, uh, the Middle East, and that, that's what has tied us so close to that region so that we even care what goes on there. That also has allied us with these uh, governments who, under normal circumstances, we would have nothing to, nothing to do with the Mubaraks, the Saudi, Saudi, Arabian, uh, Saudi and Arabian monarchies, the, uh, the uh, other oil-producing oil, oil states. And we have the means uh, to solve this problem not by sending troops over to, over to 
the Gulf, not by forming military alliances and selling lots of arms to these countries, but by, by conservation and by increased production here at home and by transitioning to electric vehicles, which we don't have to power with oil. And I, I'm astonished by the lack of understanding of this connection and, and the, the lack of uh, emphasis on doing something about it, about it here in view of the tremendous uh, sums of money that we pay, the, the, the blood of our 6,000 servicemen who died over, died o over there as we send, send uh, troops over there, the half of our trade deficit which we, which we send to, uh, that, to oil exporting uh, country. And as Dr. Sewell says, the sacrifice and the value is what we think is important by having to cooperate with these sluggish regimes. So you know, that's, that's something we ought to, ought to be doing and, and, and should have been doing for a long time. I'd only add that I think our approach to the Arab Spring, so-called Arab Spring, should be to um, take an attitude of supporting self-determination <laughs> and avoid blundering in where we are really quite ignorant about many of the domestic factions. And we have a tendency to um, lump different disparate groups together under a kind of an Islamist label, um, very foolishly. Uh, so I think, you know, a strategy to engage the Arab world is as much what not to do as it is to, what to do right now. Thank you. I want to formally uh, welcome Ambassador Kofor Black to, to the podium. Uh, welcome, Kofor. I understand you've been uh, trying to brave the elements, but we're very grateful that you're here. And uh, welcome. Um, Thank you. And so now we're going to put you to work. Um, many people have argued that we've had the intelligence we needed prior to 9-11, but we could not, quote, connect the dots, unquote, to prevent these attacks. Mm -hmm. A decade later, with all the advances in technology, we now have many, many more dots. But are we doing a better job of connecting them? And related to that, given our ever-increasing reliance on technology for intelligence gathering, should we invest more attention and resources on human assets? Holy cow. <laughs> I should have stayed in the car. <laughs> I spent, uh, this is a land speed record, I spent uh, approximately five hours getting from Northern Virginia to here, but I won't bore you with the details. That's one of the most complex questions I've ever heard. I, could, I would expect no less when, from uh, President Reese. First of all, this is me personally. I would love to meet the congressman that came up with the connect the dots phrase. <laughs> I'd like to meet him in the gym. <laughs> I remember a cartoon uh, in a newspaper somewhat after 9-11 where there's a you know, figure of a CIA guy on the left and an FBI guy on the right, and there were three dots, you know, and they're going, geez, how to do this? First of all, I think it's very misleading connecting the dots, you ask Admiral Blair. Um, even before 9-11, the, um, our technology, comparatively to these days, our technology was much lower. We didn't have a lot of the mining tools that we have now. But the, um, the wealth and the universe of details and facts that um, was left to be exploited by highly trained analysts was really kind of out of whack. What we expected to do was um, awesome, and these people did a terrific job, but over time, you know, there are gonna be times when you can't keep up with everything. So I think a compensating factor for that has been technology. Um, I think it's worked very well. This country uh, particularly has spent an awful lot of money on new tools and on intelligence, and I think we're a lot better off because of it. I think one of the next questions will be, um, you know, how much is enough? At what level do we feel that we want to sustain uh, the resources used to conduct um, operations and collection against terrorist groups? Um, I do think that um, we talked, overheard the conversation before a little bit about oil being very important and the Arab Spring being very important. And I do believe that, this, that the success and the contribution that the United States and allies can make is being well informed, so they need good information, and then make good decisions uh, and, and uh, act and cooperate with our friends overseas in a way that's cost effective and sustainable over time. You know? And I think if we do that, that we'll be able to, to um, achieve a good place into the out years. I think there's been some zigging and zagging. I personally am a plank holder to we didn't spend enough money and we didn't have enough people before 9-11, when I can go into that, it's kind of an amazing story. How few were protecting so many? It's kind of the reverse of the RAF and the Battle of Britain. Now we've gotten to a much better place. We've got lots of people, ODNI, Admiral Blair, 
greater cohesion among the various different agencies. So I think we're heading in the right direction. But I do think we have to do this at a sustainable um, cost in terms of money uh, and in terms of uh, emotional investment, certainly, of the American people. I think one, one thing that um, is important to recognize is the, there, there, there are lots of layers of providing safety. One of them is the intelligence, uh, the intelligence piece in which you actually try to find out who, who might be planning an attack, who they are, and then you do something about it. You either arrest them if it's in this country, you get another intelligence service or another country to work them in their, in their country. That, that was our only, that was all we had basically. Uh, and as Ambassador said, uh, just a few people working on it. Um, but now we just have much more general defensive protective um, measures uh, that are, are out there in terms of uh, people who come into this country, people who step on, get on airplanes, uh, general, general citizen, citizen awareness. And I, I, don't, I don't think uh, we can put all of the effort expect all of the weight to be carried by the intelligence uh, community and to expect that you're going to find every attack before it happens. I can say that, without going into details, that it is possible to conduct a fairly effective terrorist attack on the United States without giving any indication that a very fine intelligence service would be able to know. I mean, intelligence could operate perfectly and attack, a successful attack could be conducted if they were clever enough and if they were smart enough and they, they took, enough, took enough time. So you cannot expect intelligence to carry the entire weight of this thing. You have to have everything from uh, smarter, smarter systems for uh, checking out uh, people who fly on airplanes now that we know how dangerous they, they are. You have to put the defenses around uh, facilities that can have a terrible uh, effect if they are if they are uh, blown up, chemical factories uh, and, and nuclear plants and, and so on. Uh, and you have to have alert, alert citizens. Uh, several of the uh, several attacks that have been foiled in recent years are by uh, smart people looking around. The patrolman in Times Square who looked at a car parked in the wrong spot, saw some gear inside, brought it to somebody's attention and, and, and stopped, uh, stopped, stopped one plot. Uh, and there are other examples of it. So I think that I think it's got to be uh, the full range of these things because I, I think we're, we're now in a world in which globalization, with all of its availability of knowledge, with all of the effect of, me of media, has made the sort of terrorist attacks for anybody who has a, uh, has, has a twisted mind and a beef uh, a possibility, whether he's a student at Virginia, Virginia Tech or a, or a disgruntled, uh, dis disgruntled uh, person in Norway or, or a... Uh, uh, somebody who doesn't doesn't like the American government. Uh, so I'm afraid we're in a world in which we're going to have to uh, be more careful in general, and we're going to have to know a lot more about uh, U.S. citizens and foreigners just in order to avoid these uh, these attacks. Next question: What is the risk of terrorists acquiring WMD weapons of mass destruction? And I'm told to have the panelists please be specific in your answers with respect to nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, biological weapons, and radiological weapons. <laughs> it's another easy one for you. Don't all volunteer. How do you months. do this? Do you volunteer? Or yeah, you, yeah. Do you, do you, <laughs> well, we I volunteer, feel very I much like I'm you. right back in school again on the front row, <laughs> where we pointed at, you know. I can volunteer you. Why don't you go ahead, okay. Kofer? <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, recently, we used to use the letters CBRN. And uh, uh, it would stand in the rank order, chemical, bacteriological, radiological, nuclear, CBRN. And that was ranked order in terms of the probability of um, uh, an operationalized attack against the United States. My own personal view, I think this has changed around a little, lot, a little bit. Um, I, I do think that the kinetic, you know, the guy with the gun or the edged weapon, still has primacy because it's comparatively easier. Uh, and it has a reasonable shock effect, so I think that's still in play, and that would be my preference. But weapons of mass destruction, uh, I think it's in terms of how hard it is to do these things, what's the probability of what I would expect. I would probably see, um, you know, the, the weapon that has the most amount of effect and comparatively is the easiest enough to do, the bacteriological. So I think that, um, that would be number one on my list.
And again, unfortunately, with the news media that we have in the cycle, you know, it doesn't have to be a cataclysmic attack. You can imagine how these things would play on CNN, even if it's very, very limited, it still have a tremendous um, effect uh, on the uh, population. Uh, then I would, next to that, in terms of probability, I'd put chemical, although I don't think that um, it has the effectiveness of the former. And lastly, it'd be sort of radiological, you know, a dirty bomb. These are within the realm of the of the foreseeable. And nuclear, I think, I personally have friends that say this is the biggest threat that we face. Yes, it is if it actually happens. But I think when you look at the universe of threats and what you have to defend out, I put this the most least likely. And then there's, I don't know if this is really too politically correct to get into, but something you should think about is um, I think it is unreasonable as um, American citizens to expect that uh, we can be protected comprehensively 100% of the time. You know? It's like automobile accidents in this country. What do we do? Young kids, when, before they get their driver's license, we make them go to school. We have seat belts, we have airbags, we have lights, stop signs, and all this. Yet, you know, we have just about the same number of fatalities every year and our roads killed, something like 34 or 36,000, like clockwork. Well, you know, we could bring that number down if we made cars only go 35 miles an hour, everyone had to wear football helmets. So a decision was made in here, okay? That's the way it is. We could have zero dust take cars away, right? So we've made a decision in here. So I think in terms of terrorism, in terms of all the other threats there are in the world, which this is one among many, that um, we need to think about what is, a, what is a reasonable level of sustainable effort. And then if, there, if we are penetrated and there is an attack, um, that uh, it, it should be kept within the realm of validated and we agree that this is sort of threshold. Almost like an insurance policy, you know? It, you know $500 deductible, $1,000 deductible. Um, there has to be a level of reasonableness in this in our future. We can't mortgage our whole country, spend every dollar we make protecting ourselves against terrorists. We have other things. We have health care issues, we have crime, you know, we have uh, scholarships for kids going to college and the like. Thank you. So we have to always, <laughs> first, first among, first would be Washington College, of course. <laughs> you know, I mean, I just, you don't hear people bring this up very much, and I'd be a little loath to say this, you know, on TV, like this is the big bright idea. Okay. People say, well, that's too cruel, you know. Yes, your government will do everything it can to protect you, but um, I think there, these days into our future, I think perhaps we need to inject a little bit of validated reasonableness. There's a limit to which we will go. We have other kids that have needs, medical needs, education. This is one, one among many. This really came home to me when I would go around in the third world as the head of counterterrorism in the CIA. I'd go to countries I'd served in and you know, these fine people would be there, and I'd go up to the heads of their intelligence services. You can pick your favorite African country and go, listen, my friend, we really need help against these terrorists, you know, these Al-Qaeda people coming in there. Let's cooperate, and we've got some money, we've got some training and whatnot. And you could see that the, the conflict in their eyes, yes, yeah, sure, happy to help you. But you know, in this country, you may have mass starvation, AIDS. Eh. So when they rank order things, you know, some outsider Arabs coming in with guns and stuff running amok is, doesn't really rank very high. So we would come in and say, you know, can you elevate it? And so that was very much in our interest. But I think that argument also applies to us. We have other interests, and I don't know if the rest of the panel agrees, but perhaps in our future we can modulate it in a way that the American people agree. There shouldn't be people, you know, in a conference room in the government that decide how it should be. It should be something that we all sort of discuss and agree upon. Audrey. Yes, actually, we were talking about that before you came, Cooper. <laughs> um, that we agree with you completely, that we need to have a more realistic assessment of risk. And actually, um, I've been doing some work with the World Economic Forum to bring in some of the concepts that are used in the insurance industry into how we think about um, terrorism and counterterrorism and how we respond. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a hard slog because the insurance industry is not, I mean, there are reasons why uh, some of these assessments are not, they don't really want to share them. But um, mm -hmm. we need to have more of that kind of a very objective way of looking at risks and um, potential risks. Mm -hmm. But on the question of uh, CBNR, the only thing I wanted to add to what you had to say mm -hmm. 
is that we often forget that we need to look at the group and the motivations for that group in using those mm -hmm. weapons too. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a tendency to look at technologies and to see them as driving, uh, you know, this goes into how we look at military history often, you know, technologies change the course of a war. So we see that as translating right straight over into counterterrorism, but um, certain groups, like, for example, the Islamists and Al-Qaeda, I think it would be unlikely that they would want to bring smallpox, for example, on a playing in, in that scenario that kept being played out in the, in the uh, press, because that's not, a, that's not the kind of death that, that the martyrdom you know, sort of paradigm, it doesn't fit. So you, you also have to, to try to think about what is the logic of the group that might potentially use these weapons. It's not just the availability of the weapons. Um, right after I got to Capitol Hill uh, and I was working with congressmen, there was this tremendous fear about another anthrax attack. Anthrax attacks, mm -hmm. and and I went from office to office to office saying, look, you know, take a chill pill. Mm -hmm. This is not necessarily going to help an Al Qaeda type group achieve its aims. You know, work through the logic. Mm -hmm. So in any case, there there are two sides to that argument. Right. Next question. This has to do with Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta's statement this past June that Al Qaeda <laughs> is near to a strategic defeat. Do you agree with that assessment? And will the United States still be fighting Al-Qaeda or its offshoots 10 years from now? So well, I, can, I can start since I wrote an op-ed that disagreed with that point of view, so I might as well, <laughs> might as well repeat it. I haven't changed my mind in two weeks. <laughs> but uh, the, I think the defeat of Al Qaeda to me means, and Cronin's written books about it. I think it. I think it means that you have scattered individuals who have who have beasts that may have an Islamist uh, basis to them. You don't really have an, or, an organization that is passing money and training and planning around and, and making coordinated making coordinated attacks. You're, you just have a bunch of uh, disgruntled in, in individuals. Um, to get to that, to get to that stage, uh, I believe that uh, we have to go beyond our our current uh, tactics to, against Al Qaeda, which in, involve a lot of offensive uh, action involving intelligence uh, intelligence services, uh, ours and ours and others. Uh, I think we have to get at the um, the fundamental causes in, in the countries that breed uh, the people who seem to flock to the Al-Qaeda banner, whether they be in Egypt or in Yemen or in, or in Jordan or in, or in uh, Pac Pakistan. Uh, and I believe we have to, uh, we have to work with the, the countries there, not just on combating terrorism, but on the, but on the, uh, uh, on, on the conditions that motivate people to, uh, to join those, those organizations. So I think to get to that next stage, we have to take a different approach to, to things. And I think as long as we are continue the main force of our effort on, on uh, putting up names on posters and then putting red, X, red, red X's through them, we're not going to get, that, get to that next uh, stage. So I, I don't think we are, I don't think we are uh, within that much of defeating Al Qaeda using our current tactics. I think we have to go into a new set of, uh, a new set of uh, uh, approaches to it. Sarah. Well, I'm not sure quite what strategic defeat of Al Qaeda means. I mean, I, I think that we have to remember terrorism is, a, is an offensive game. Um, it's a little bit like insurgency. It's a lot easier to destroy than it is to defend. I mean, um, to Ambassador Black's point, the, the, the ability to use plain old weapons or threats of plain old weapons, forget the fancy stuff, to so fear and uncertainty and distrust um, and force us to spend a ton of money uh, is, is, it's too easy. And there will always be people inside, outside the United States that want to do that. So I think, I think terrorism is with us to stay. I think Al-Qaeda as Al-Qaeda will undoubtedly, and I defer to Dr. Cronin, but morph into different forms. But it's, it's already sort of touched and franchised enough that when we talk about the defeat of Al-Qaeda, do we mean the defeat of, of, of 
of any, you know, Salafist group that has a broader vision or any Salafist affiliated group that just simply wants to destroy international order as we know it. And I just, I don't see this going away. I think this is, we are in a new world of threat management and whether we're talking about, um, I mean, this is not just terrorism, it's also our dependence on cyber and the, and the ease with which, we haven't even talked about this, but the ease with which non-state actors or, or any, any actors um, can basically mess with us through, through uh, a wide variety of means. We are, we are on defense against sort of a, 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 an offensively favored set of capabilities and actors. And I, see that, I don't see that as changing over the next several decades. It can be ameliorated, it can be managed, but I agree with the earlier comments that this is a question of trying to have a rational discussion about cost-benefit analysis, which look at our healthcare, this is never easy in America mm. to do. And, it's, and mm. it's a question of trying to be more resilient um, and prepared for the realities that we'll face. Audrey, you have literally written the book about <laughs> defeating Al-Qaeda, so we can't let this opportunity pass. Well, I, you know, I'm gonna sound like an academic because I'm gonna start out by saying, well, what do we mean by Al-Qaeda? <laughs> You know, if we're talking about the core of Al-Qaeda, yes, strategic defeat, I think, is achievable. If we're talking about this idea of Al-Qaeda and, and some of the local groups that bring the name Al-Qaeda and try to associate themselves with Al-Qaeda, there we have to be very different. We have to be very careful. Because when you're in a terrorist campaign, there are really three sides that you're thinking about. That is the state, the group, and then the audiences that are involved in watching what's going on. And to the degree that an an attack achieves its aim with respect to those audiences. And I'm not just talking about friends and uh, you know, relatives of the victims. I'm also talking about potential recruits for a group. Uh, to the extent that a group is able to achieve what it's trying to do with that audience, it can perpetuate itself. So the good news with respect to Al-Qaeda and strategic defeat, and I mean the core of Al-Qaeda, is that it's not achieving that resonance among an audience as it was some years ago. I think that the kind of ideas that Bin Laden put forth are looked at as, as getting close to being anachronistic now and because you have a tremendous amount of inspiration that is taking that space um, that we call the Arab Spring. And it takes different forms, but it's, there's a new movement that Al-Qaeda has been sidelined from. But part of whether Al-Qaeda has strategic defeat depends upon us as well, because when we're talking about local affiliates, like AQIM in the Maghreb, or AQAP in uh, Yemen, or you, know, you name it, Jama'a Islamiyah, Abu Sayyaf, I mean, there's a long list. Some of these groups are groups that have had long lives and have had previously local aims, and they've named themselves or renamed themselves Al-Qaeda. And so we swallow that and we say, oh, it's Al-Qaeda. And I think that's a mistake, because part of whether we can have strategic defeat depends upon whether we can break out these individual groups and affiliates and help focus them back toward their local aims and stop perpetuating this broad image that Al-Qaeda only benefits from, Al-Qaeda as a movement. Co, for the next one is for you first. Both the Bush and Obama administrations believe that there needs to be a worldwide effort to defeat violent extremism. Are America's allies around the world carrying their weight in this fight? Hmm. Well, I'll fall back to the United Nations on this. When I was both in the CIA and the State Department, I always thought it was noteworthy that uh, the community of nations in the United Nations despite the efforts of all, we're unable to agree on a single definition of terrorism. And it starts from that. And if you're a practitioner of counterterrorism, obviously the best way to do this is to work with your friends overseas. You know, Kofor Black walking through Abuja, Nigeria, probably won't get too far trying to pretend he's a local. <laughs> Having friends overseas is the way to go. That's the sustainable, most effective way to do it. But each country, at least uh, up to my current knowledge, had its own sort of view of A, the threat, what's important to them, as I referred to a little bit earlier, B, um, who really are the terrorists of concern to them. And I think almost one could say every country has a view at some variance. Some of these are huge. 
Uh, and it has been the challenge, certainly for the United States, to work with each one of these partners bilaterally and regionally to kind of make sense of this and be um, effective. I do think that uh, much of our success overseas in working with our friends has been fueled to a large extent by the financial resources which you have kindly provided every year with your income tax. Um, those countries, like my friends in Africa that don't have the money for, for training or whatnot, you know, if possible, the United States would help. And so um, we've had the luxury of being well financed. Uh, I'm not too sure that we will be as well financed in the future. I think we'll have less money to do what we have done before. I think we'll have this do, we're going to have to do this more efficiently and effectively. And I love the comments of the panel members. They're right on the money. The first thing is, you know, in war you have to define who your enemy is. And if you're in the CIA doing counterterrorism, you have to be very specific, if only to marshal your resources, but also to engage the right people as targets that are a threat to your country and a threat to your friends, and nobody else. One of, my, um, one of my issues that I see through time is um, a sort of blurring of what's the problem, who, who's the problem set. I can tell you personally, before 9-11, when I would go to hearings where Congress, and I would talk about the threat of Al-Qaeda, and you know, it wasn't as embraced as perhaps they would like to think now, but there was great confusion about these Al-Qaeda people and these Hezbollah people. And you know, you'd get commentary like, well, when you sweep up these Al-Qaeda people, can you kind of throw in Hezbollah too? I mean, this is like talking the difference between, you know, um, whales and asteroids around the sun. I mean, <laughs> from a counterterrorism perspective, it's so dissimilar, it, is, it leaves you breathless. The point is, you know, all of these, quote, terrorist groups are not the same. I think a great many of them have, can be um, engaged with one way or the other to move them into a position where they're certainly less threatening to us and less threatening to other people, and leave those hardcore uh, few that will not change their ways and who are determined to fight, uh, leave those to be engaged by what is now um, a military force, the United States military, that's second to none, practiced over 10 years, JSOC, and those people. You know, I think there's a right tool for everything, but traditional counterterrorism techniques to find them and get them arrested and all that, should be left for, for those people that really deserve it, if you will. And the vast majority of these people do not. I personally, um, uh, with after 9-11, the Afghan war, since it was the folks that I work with that projected in there, and you know, we did it, it was very complex, worked out well, but the rules were very simple. You know, know who the enemy is, have a good story, go in there effectively, separate out you know, the guys that are really bad from the ones that are not so bad, and resolve it one way or the other. And then with time, you have basically no distinction between Al-Qaeda, foreign fighters, the Taliban, and it gives me vertigo. So the same people that I bribed to let us get at the Taliban, we wound up fighting. So what I'm saying is, you know, if you go into a bar looking for a fight, you know, isolate the guy you're gonna go for and try to keep everyone else away. It shouldn't be going to the bar, declare combat with everybody and see what happens. I think our instinct is like that. We can't afford to do that anymore. Whether it was a good idea in the past, um, uh, I do not know. But um, I do think that the time has come to develop a really comprehensive plan of which pieces of, of national statecraft are we going to use. And I vote for it not falling all on intelligence. It's a fool's errand, you know? The default button being, oh, well, it's an intelligence failure. It's nonsense. You need everything else. And that boutique part that's left, Sick them. But everybody else really shouldn't fall into that box. I think that's where we're going. I think that's what works. And I think we have to be very erudite. I mean, I was reading in the paper that the guy who's the head of the Libyan opposition apparently had been arrested and detained and interrogated and whatnot. What a world, huh? I could just see him on a radio calling NATO fighters, you know, to bomb the Libyans. I mean, what's up with this? So I'm going to be real careful. Who are the real bad guys? Unless they're really bad, maybe there's another way to deal with them, you know? Uh, so, being from the, from the agency, that's generally our approach. You know, do it the cheapest, easiest way, and and you know, kinetic and engaging like the movies should be left only for those hardcore cases. Um, I do think the Al Qaeda of 2001 has been greatly destroyed. 
um, you, if you check through, you know, President Bush with the X's on the thing, we've gone through that flip chart a number of times. So the people they have that have moved up, uh, the ones that have survived this far, are few in number. I do think their capability has been greatly degraded. You know, that's nice. I mean, that's very satisfying, but you also say, like, so what? These other associated and affiliated groups have to be engaged in a way so that we don't have to spend all of these resources in this way. Counterterrorism is very inefficient and it's very expensive. So let's leave it for those who really deserve it. I think one of our dilemmas in dealing with other countries is the no, no coincidence that the uh, Al-Qaeda groups that, that uh, we're worried about go to places in the world where there's very little government control of them. So you have a pretty weak partner in, in a lot of these uh, places, Somalia, Yemen, uh, northwest part of uh, northwest part of Pakistan. So when you go into, as uh, Ambassador Black said, you go into these countries and said, by the way, why don't you just enforce the laws in your own country, arrest bad people, uh, you find that uh, there, there's, <coughs> there's just large portions of Indian territory out there where the host country is, is not enforcing its own, own laws. And then you, then you have to uh, figure out, okay, what do we do under those, uh, under those uh, circumstances? And you generally do pretty short-term things to take care of immediate, immediate problems, whereas you know in the back of your mind that over time, the only long-term solution is for these countries to establish basic uh, services, justice, administration of various kinds, make the people who make their citizens who live in that part of the country uh, want to throw in their lot with the government, not, uh, not want to be out there on their own. But uh, in places like uh, Somalia, northwest Pakistan, eastern, so southern, northern uh, Yemen, uh, parts of Afghanistan, uh, that's, a, that's a long, a long uh, way to go. Last question for our panelists. Looking ahead, what worries you the most about the terror threats we face? Why don't we start with Sarah, and we can just go right down the panel. What worries you the most? What keeps you awake at night? Um, at the risk of sounding off topic, <laughs> um, <laughs> right now what worries me the most is the political discourse in this country because if we can't have a rational conversation that's fact-based and reasoned and involves compromise, then we will not be able to make the decisions that we need to make as a nation to stay strong in all aspects of staying strong. And, um, and I don't believe that, that partisanship has to stop at the water's edge, but I do believe that there has to be a basic level of, of comedy and of empiricism and, of, and a valuing of compromise as part of a democratic process as opposed to seeing it as a weakness of character. Um, and that's what worries me the most right now in terms of our nation's ability to respond to any threats in the future, including terrorism. Thank you. I, don't know. I, I think uh, Sarah's point is, is the right one, but I would phrase it, uh, phrase it slightly different. I, I think that terrorists is not the, and this is true when I was DNI, was not the number one thing that worried me about long-term real threat to the really vital interests of this, uh, of this country. That was pretty petty ante compared to the uh, competitive uh, challenge that China was, uh, was throwing at us in, in many areas, the, uh, the risks of, uh, of uh, uh, the cyber um, dependence of this, uh, of this country and what could be done there, not by terrorists, but by but by other countries and, and, and criminals. Terrorists are a relatively small uh, player in that area. The, and, and, and the fundamental uh, finan international financial vulnerability of the uh, country. So in my, in my list, uh, terrorist is, uh, uh, terrorism is getting, getting down there, and I would be greatly surprised, I, greatly surprised if anything on the scale of 9-11 could be, could be uh, done again in 20, 2011 or or, or later, I think that terrorists have been reduced to being able, just being Al Qaeda has been reduced to just doing uh, small, uh, small scale attacks, uh, two Zs and three Zs uh, at the most. Um, the, the one that I had experienced was this young Nigerian named Abdul Matalab. He basically was given four days training, given fifteen thousand dollars, told to 
get into the United States any way you can on any on any airplane, and when you're when you're in American airspace, pull this uh, pull this pull this lanyard. And that was about, about the best that they could do at that time, and I think that's about the best that they uh, that they can they can do based on the work that we do. So I, I guess my answer is, I'm, from an objective point of view, I'm not really that worried about uh, terrorism, but that does depend us, on us putting it in context uh, among the great challenges that we face. Great. Thank you. Audrey. Well, I support what's been said thus far, but also um, I don't worry so much about the next attack. There will be another attack. But I'm very concerned about what we'll do after that. And if we get into a kind of an action-reaction um, relationship where we're being, as a great power, where we're focusing upon what is a relatively small threat in the context of the broader threats that Admiral Blair has just mentioned, I think that'll be a tremendous mistake. I worry about the fact that the United States is struggling very hard to have a broader sense of a grand strategy or a, a balanced strategy for a great power in terms of its economy, even in terms of its regional strategies, in terms of how to withdraw from Afghanistan and Iraq. I worry that we've greatly strengthened um, Iran and the, uh, the influence that it has in the region. That has been one of the outcomes of what we've done in both Iraq and Afghanistan. We need to think very hard about what implications that would have for us with respect to our dependence upon oil and um, our presence in that region, which is unfortunately um, compulsory. I don't think we have a broad strategic approach in the way that we did through um, some of our more mature years of the Cold War. Not that we need to have another Soviet threat and try to foist that kind of thinking upon ourselves, but I do think that we need to stop obsessing about the risk of terrorism. Thank you, Andre. Kofor, last word. Um, I agree with everyone. I would just say from my personal perspective, um, you know, um, we Americans sort of have this sense that anything worth doing is worth overdoing. And um, uh, I can tell you before 9-11, it was very difficult to sell the threat of Al-Qaeda to this, this nation's leaders or to the media or actually to the Congress or, you know, anybody else. Very difficult. Um, yet, with the cataclysmic event of 9-11, it was sort of like uh, everyone was, was in shock. I th would exclude my people, since they had been warning about this type of thing happening. But they were in shock, and all of my problems, except the enemy, all went away like that. Before, I used to go up to OMB, and you know, I need money, and they'd say, well, we need to buy jet fuel for the Pacific Fleet. We're low. And, uh, one thing or the other, didn't get much money, not more authorities. It was unbelievably frustrating. Talk to my wife, she'll tell you. <laughs> I mean, it's like, like you know, we're not dumb, we can see how this is coming, so it's very frustrating. But the, it was the contrast of my life from before 9-11, you know, where we had plans, you know, the Afghan war plan, the worldwide attack matrix, and we, then after 9-11, I have got to tell you, it was like the clouds opened, the sun rays came down, the heavenly choirs played, no problem with money, no problem with authorities. It was unbelievable. And it was the right thing at the right time to buy us time. But I do think that um, we need to decide what is really important to us. And I agree with the panelists. As an intelligence officer, my beef, and I admire Admiral Blair having lives through this, but perhaps things have changed and maybe he'll enlighten us, but my observation was um, I never found leadership in the agency that would ever say no to a customer. And so therefore, you're responsible for everything, everywhere, all the time, and you're expected to be able to surge in excruciating detail. I spent most of my career in Africa. You know, you're doing terrorists and, you know, Chinese missile issues, and then it's, you know, the African lakes problem in Africa. Well, how come you didn't know about this? In my view, this has to stop. We have to decide what we want. You know, you want to buy a Corvette or do you want a station wagon? You know, you don't get the whole fleet of cars all the time. And I think we need, we, we as a country need to come together and do that. I also, having spent a lot of my life on counterterrorism, I mean, because that's what I do, it's very important to me. But if you put that in conjunction with other 
uh, catastrophically uh, challenging problems, um, I don't think it's, it's not number one. It may not even be at the top. Um, you know, there are a lot, of, a lot of ways to get hurt a lot more than a small group of terrorists that make it through a pretty good filter. So I, I, my wish would be, and I'm very optimistic for you. You have a great future and you have great challenges ahead of you. And you will be tested. And I know you'll do extremely well. But we have to decide what is important to us. And you know, all pigs are not equal. You have to decide what you're going to do and then go do it and do it as well as you can. And I think the terrorism thing now may be going down a bit. And as the panelists suggested, there are other ways to engage these targets. And whenever people talk to you, at least in counterterrorism, start saying interchanging words like terrorists and insurgents and guerrillas, that's where you hold the phone. You know, these are, these are not the same thing. You know, insurgents and, and guerrillas, com completely different. I would suspect even the CIA is supported some somewhere. But they don't support terrorists. It's a different kettle of fish. You've got to know what you're talking about. You've got to know who the enemy is. And uh, I'm very optimistic. We have challenges ahead but also encouraging political discourse in this country is crucially important. So, you know, keep, keep your congressman and congresswoman in tow, write them letters, tell them what you think, and, uh, and drive on. Well, thank you. This has been an extraordinarily rich and insightful uh, conversation with uh, the most experienced and knowledgeable folks I, I could find, and uh, we've all benefited greatly. So on behalf of all of us at Washington College, please join me in thanking our panelists.